Hello everyone, this is Venom Geek Media here, and today, by the request of Navark, Tali DT, we're going to be discussing starbases. Well, effectively, we're going to be asking the question, what even is a starbase? You see, we see a lot of starbases throughout the various shows, but it's never really clearly defined what is and what isn't a starbase. Sometimes they're big space stations, sometimes they're facilities on planets. So, what I hope to do here is come up with a understanding of A, what a starbase actually is, because it seems like a pretty broad definition, and then try to sort of categorize them in a way that we can then sort of understand starbases and sort of rank them. So in its simplest form, what is a starbase? Nuts and bolts. What does something need to be to be a starbase? A base capable of rendering resupply and replenishment to a starship. Now this covers a whole lot of ground because starships are very, very complex things and need a great many things. And Potentially, a starbase may only necessarily supply some of these things. So, you know, in terms of what a starship needs, I mean, that's huge. A starship needs anything from deuterium, antimatter, dilithium, replacement parts, big parts, small parts, tiny parts, huge parts, human parts, human food, alien food, medicine, alien medicine, ammunition, electronic components, sensors. The list is endless. The point is, starships are big, complex things which have a lot of various systems on board and, you know, various systems from the organic systems being the people, the inorganic systems, primary systems and the auxiliary systems and the, the support systems, you know, the vacuum cleaners. No one ever thinks about what happens if you're, if you, what happens if the, the vacuum cleaner on board a starship, what happens if those break? The point is, is that starships are very, very complex military assets that need an awful lot of resupply of an awful lot of things. So, ultimately, to make our life simpler, we can probably break down resupply into several basic categories, about four basic categories. And then within these categories, we can add levels. So, for example, uh, we have fuel. And fuel, or level one of fuel, the most basic kind of fuel you can supply a ship with, is deuterium. Maybe the next level up is you can supply it with dilithium and then antimatter, possibly dilithium and antimatter. You're not going to sell those things separately because you kind of need those for most starships to work unless you're a Romulan. Everyone needs deuterium. You know, anyone can um, harvest and store deuterium. It's pretty simple stuff. Dilithium and antimatter, yeah, it's a little bit more complex and you probably have to have several regulations and things. You can't just go around manufacturing antimatter willy-nilly. That's dangerous, potentially weapons-grade stuff. Although I'd say probably torpedo-grade antimatter is probably a little bit different to the stuff you put in your engine. But the point being, between these levels you are also going to need like certain levels of authorization. Spare parts, you know, and the, you can basically break that down into small parts and ammunition. Ammunition is effectively a spare part. Your weapon won't work without it. And these are basic simple spare parts. Small, need in large number. Then you're going to have large and specialist spare parts. And of course, again, this is going to be your grade 2 installation. You're going to need less of these, less number, but they're bigger, complex, probably a very sensitive pieces of equipment. For your human supplies, you need, well, you need to support the, the people that live on your ship, you need food and medicine. Um, you then need, at level 2, personnel. So you need a place where you can, you know, serve as an effective uh, travel hub, logistics hub, for inbound and outbound personnel. You know, p personnel transfers, stuff like that. As people are going to and from assignments or, you know, bringing on and off, or, you know, mission specialists or scientists, stuff like that. And then your grade 3, you know, this is, I probably wouldn't put this at grade 3, this is probably a bonus grade, but R&R facilities. If your ship has been in deep space for quite a while, you want a planet or a starbase which has pretty robust R&R uh, facilities, especially back in the day of, of original series, where perhaps things are quite confined on your starship and you don't have a holodeck. 
Fourthly, we have then structural. This uh, bo boils down to basic maintenance, uh, refurbishment, replacing certain things or, or, you know, cleaning up certain things. Think about the, the Baryon Sweep, which is basically the Enterprise being debarnacled. Space barnacles, basically. I know they're not space barnacles, it's space radiation that they accumulate, but they're, they're space barnacles is what they're doing, effectively. And then replacement of parts, you know. The ship's physical structure, and also particularly certain parts, perhaps more than others, probably take more strain. You think about the way a Starfleet ship is built, and it's built, you know, with the saucer section forward. Saucer section is probably taking, not only is it probably taking a lot of, if you like, subspace resistance, because it's the thing that's at the head of the ship, but it's also going to be probably the most targeted part of the ship. So, again, you know, doesn't necessarily ever need a hole blown in it, but if it's taken a lot of enemy fire, you know, that might wear down and compromise bits of the structure in places. So, again, things like that. You need to structurally replace certain elements, and that's perhaps part of the reason why we see so, those sort of modular designs so early in Starfleet wasn't actually because of, you know, source of separation capabilities, but instead the fact that they realised certain parts of a starship were taking more more punishment than others and it would be easier to just swap in fresh parts rather than have the whole ship go into a yard for repairs that concept kind of then gets taken to its nth degree in the prometheus and then of course kind of to cap it off i would say with any of these facilities but probably again those higher security facilities you're going to have an option for command and control so effectively what we have is four categories in two of those categories, there are about two levels, and then you have two of these which can score up to three. We can thereby create a starship tier system from one to ten. You know, tier one being the most basic thing, a basic deuterium depot or supply dump, up to tier ten, which is your all singing, all dancing, earth space dock sort of deal. So, I mean, we'll, we'll go through it, break down the individual... Not the each individual scoring tier, but the broad tier. So, tier 1 through 4 is your basic depots, usually on a planet's surface, because that's easy to construct. You can include antimatter refineries, but it's most likely going to be, you know, basic stuff. You know, deuterium. It could be anything, you know, either a couple things at grade 1. Either, you know, everything is grade 1, or a couple things... At grade two, you know, it can be any kind of variation within that, but it's fairly limited uh, in terms of what it will cover. It's not going to necessarily have all the features you need, or if it is, it's going to be the most basic of stuff. Examples of a starbase like this would include something like Farpoint Station, which is, of course, a planetary station. Uh, also, Starbase 11 in original series, which again, planet based starbase but it will probably have all those basic supplies, you know, the basic minimum of supplies to be counted as a starbase. You know, do you really count some some group of colonists who have set up a small deuterium refinery? Do you count that as a starbase? I suppose, actually, yes, to be recognised, and this is actually canon, if we look at, you know, the conversations that happen in Encounter at Farpoint, it's that to be an officially recognised starbase, you require certification and authorization and again when we go up higher on the grades it's going to be less and less of these sort of grassroots sort of civilian star bases which you can get uh, and much more of them are going to be sort of starfleet built because it's just way way more costly it requires a far greater investment to build the infrastructure and facilities for higher grade star bases and also you then require that authorization to, you know, hold all these sensitive items, you know. Again, holding weapons grade uh, antimatter is going to be, you know, much, much greater than holding sort of just engine grade antimatter. And so levels 5 through to 8 include basically your smaller space stations. These are not dry dock facilities, you can't park your ship inside. But they're generally going to be supported by a parallel infrastructure on the planet's surface. Again, probably, you know, similar to the starbases that we just see on a planet in and of itself. 
it's going to be lightly fortified, capable of basically defending itself and its perimeter. Might have some, you know, in terms of its defensive complement, probably defended by some, some fighters or shuttlecraft, you know, or skiffs. Small stuff. Examples of these kind of star bases would be Deep Space Nine uh, and K-7. You know, Deep Space Nine is probably the f highest up on this list being that it does actually have a shield bubble in which you could actually park some ships and it could then defend those ships with its own shield. But most of the time, if there's an attack coming on a station like this, you find somewhere else to be. Uh, generally being that the incoming enemy probably has a problem with the station and not you. Effectively, your interstellar crossroads. These are your interstellar crossroads. They are they're where most of the shipping is going to go and be based around and where cargo is going to change hands and you know all the stuff that we see happening at Deep Space Nine that's kind of what you can expect from a medium you know what is effectively a medium sized starbase. Grades 9 through 10 cover basically major fortified stations these are central hubs Stuff like the, the Earth space dock or the original series remastered Starbase, Tiger Core. They have large replacement parts available. So whole, you know, they'll have whole engine nacelles. They possibly have their own internal dry dock facilities or are probably likely supported by additional dry dock facilities. And they will also have dedicated R and R facilities. You know, you see Earth Space Dock that has a massive, great park in the lower mushroom. Apparently, that's a, that's at least what the designers suggested. That the the lower mushroom is actually just this huge dome which contains enormous parks, public parks, which you know, certainly that's a very um, robust R and R facility, and that's essentially what a Great Ten Starbase would be. It would be all singing, all dancing, all the authorization, all the sensitive equipment, all the fortifications. It's probably going to be, not only is itself going to be probably armed, it's going to be probably supported by smaller fortifications and turrets and things and sensor grids. It's also probably going to have a small defensive flotilla, something of, in the range of uh, attack ships, escorts and destroyers protecting it as well. So this is really our grading system for how I would rate a starbase going from 1 through to 10. Um, that's my system. This is my system. You can see it on screen now. Uh, and I think you can grade most starbases on this basis in terms of, you know, how much facilities it has. I may have missed some. There may be some blind spots, but you get the idea. We can certainly basically tear it down to three simple varieties. Your your basic planet side facilities, your medium stations, your way stations, and your central sector logistics hubs, your, your primary bases and fortifications. And really this kind of system, this kind of grading system would explain the variety of star bases we see throughout Trek. It is a very rough grading system as I say, and actually, thinking about it, this may actually even relate to numbers, possibly. That's just the thing. Deep Space Nine, well, that would take it over to Grade Nine. Possibly, possibly. Depends how much you rate those R&R &R facilities. You know, or K7. Seven sits perfectly in that, um, that tier. That's a... I don't think that's necessarily actually what it is, but it would be a useful thing to, to sort of add to any starbase name is put its grade alongside its 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 title um, because then you could kind of get an idea of what's going on at this starbase and how important really is it so make sure to share your ideas in the comments on that subject of to you know how you would score a starbase you know what are the basic features what are the next level features what are the top level features top that up to a score and then we can you know say oh well this starbase here that's a grade one, That's a, this is a grade three, this is a grade nine, so on and so forth. And I think the other thing is also that star bases can be civilian undertakings. Now, again, the higher up you go, the less and less likely that's going to be because of how expensive it is. You think about um, the infrastructure needed to support and operate large vessels is very, very different to 
the infrastructure needed to operate a small skiff in the real world or a speedboat. You know, anyone can do that. Anyone can have, you know, speedboat fuel. Not everyone can have, you know, not anyone can set up a refueling facility for the giant uh, Maersk uh, super cat, you know, super haulers or whatever. You sort of see how there is a necessary cutoff point where you'll see less and less of these civilian endeavors and far, far more of these military built facilities. That's that's my broad ideas on star bases. So uh, again, make sure to leave your thoughts in the comments. If you like this video, uh, make sure to show your appreciation via a super thanks. That is greatly appreciated. Uh, and thank you to my members, my Navarx, David Reeves, Tully DT, and Jeffrey Ballard. My commanders, Miami Jules, Captain's Quarters, Chase Rector, PQSK, Philip Ty, Jeff Hallam, Bird Monster, Mark Philippe, Robert Sampson, Sean Farrell, Guillermo Martinez, Das Blas, Adam Bowman, and Nathaniel Mead. And I salute my Centurions, Pendleberry, BOS Domestic Disputes, Marcus Hall, Julian Arnott, Freedom Trooper, Ocalcatum Quaesto, Squadra Course, and Gabe Logan. And I thank all my sub-lieutenants. Thank you guys for supporting the channel, and I will see you all in the next video.